Hey, Facebook friends, family, we're here tonight on our Bible study, 66 Books in 66 Days. We are going to be in Exodus tonight, but I want to uh, share with you some, uh, some follow-up from last night. Um, I did post on the uh, video live feed from last night the two links that, uh, that are from uh, the Bible Project that will show uh, the overall summary of the first half of the book of Genesis and then the second. It's in two different videos. And so I encourage you to go and check that out. Uh, tonight we will be in, in Exodus, and I will post um, the links to that when we finish up tonight. But I do want to begin tonight uh, with a uh, offering a prayer as we get into our overview and our study of the book of Exodus. So let's uh, let's give some glory to God by bowing our hearts, our minds, and our spirits to God. Lord, we thank you again for bringing us together through this technology. We ask your blessings uh, as we uh, study tonight the book of Exodus. Open up our hearts and minds for a new understanding of what we may be able to take and apply to our living today. Bless each one, Lord, who is listening. Bless their families. Give us strength through this time and help us to continue to walk in your ways and to trust in you. We praise you, Lord, for all that you do for us, seeking you for good health and wise wisdom as we move through the coming weeks. Uh, Lord, just continue to bless us as we try to work our way through this new way of connecting together and sharing your great word. We praise you, we love you, in the name of Jesus, who is our Lord. Amen. So toward the end of Genesis, um, we hear uh, Joseph talking to his brothers. Um, and in Genesis 50, verse 19, it says, But Joseph said to them, Don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So then don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and spoke kindly to them. This is the uh, very tail end of the book of Genesis. The last handful of verses talk about the death of Joseph. And as we turn the page, we get into uh, the Exodus, the rest of the family uh, in the lineage of Abraham. And when we look at what Joseph says to his brothers, you planned this for evil, but God planned it for good. We can be assured through this that God is faithful. God is faithful to rescue. God is faithful to bless us. And he does this many times throughout the Old Testament, especially in Genesis and Exodus. And when I think of what Joseph says to his brothers, I am reminded of Romans 8, verse 28. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. You see, this is further reason, this is further assurance for us to have endurance through any circumstance that we come across because God is at work. God is truly faithful, bringing good out of the chaos and the messes that we as humans create, delivering us time after time uh, again into the right relationship with him. And it's almost as if God is in this uh, relationship of cooperating with us, with those uh, whom remain obedient, those um, who work with him to create good. And so that gets us into uh, the book of Exodus, uh, which is the recording of the events of Israel and their deliverance from Egypt and also their development as the nation of Israel. Uh, we learned in Genesis that uh, Jacob was no longer called Jacob, but there was a time that he became known as Israel as he wrestled with God, wrestled with the angel. We mentioned that last night. Uh, but the, in that wrestling, he is begging, fighting, uh, pleading with God to bless him. 
And God just, uh, God loves his stamina. God loves his fight. And God blesses uh, Jacob and says, but your name will no longer be Jacob. Your name will be Israel. And that's symbolic for the raising up of the people of Israel that came from the line of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so um, we see that Moses was probably the author of this, uh, writing to the people of Israel, writing approximately the same time as he wrote uh, Genesis. So I can see that there were probably days when um, when Moses was not climbing up the mountain, uh, that he was uh, down in uh, his tent with his wife, and he was uh, having someone scribe these letters as he was trying not to forget all the happenings of what God was doing for those who love him, those who are obedient to him. The key verse that comes out of this comes from uh, Exodus chapter 3, the Lord said, I have indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt. I have heard the crying out because of their slave drivers, and I am concerned about their suffering. So now go, I'm sending you to the Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. And so this is what Moses is charged with. And the key people, of course, are Moses. Um, all of the book of Exodus features Moses, even going into Leviticus and Numbers uh, and Deuteronomy because Moses is the, uh, we, we believe that Moses is the author of the first five books of Scripture. And so we have Moses, we have his sister Miriam, we have his brother Aaron, but we also have Pharaoh and the Pharaoh's daughter, and we have Jethro, who is the father-in-law of Moses. And we have Joshua. Joshua begins to show up in the latter chapters of the book of Exodus. Um, one of the special, special features that always uh, makes me think um, is that Exodus relates more miracles than any other of the Old Testament books. And so we sometimes we, we think of, uh, of the miracles being uh, done by Jesus, but we also need to think of the miracles that were done uh, by God through, through Moses um, as he goes and he uh, meets with Pharaoh and asks uh, for Pharaoh to let his people go. And so the miracles that come because God gives, um, gives Moses the staff and that staff uh, is the, uh, the symbol and the element of the miracles that uh, help set the people free. We also want to think about the uh, covenant relationships. We didn't talk about that much last night in Genesis, but uh, a covenant is uh, a promise. A covenant is uh, a blessing. And in Genesis, we find the covenant um, that is an unconditional covenant uh, of sorts uh, with the exception that the, pe the people that God is having and uh, making covenants with, making promises with, uh, is a covenant of trust and a covenant of love, which leads people into following God. And so there was the covenant that God had with Adam and Eve. There was the covenant with Noah, the promise of the rainbow, that God would not flood the earth, uh, destroy the earth by flood again. There's the promise to Abraham that he would be the father of many nations. And so the covenant relationship that comes out of that through uh, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even leading to Joseph. When we get into Exodus, there's this covenant relationship that God has with Moses, who is the, the voice, the uh, mouthpiece, the, the vessel that God is most in communication with, mainly because the people were afraid to be in communication with God. They were afraid to get near God because there were times when God said, hey, don't come near the mountain um, because it's not a good place for you to be because maybe you're unclean or maybe, uh, maybe um, you're, you're not trusting as much as you should. And so here we have this covenant relationship that begins because Moses uh, at first reluctantly, uh, but then full force goes uh, with his brother Aaron to do the task that God set before him. When we look at the, uh, the blueprint that comes out of the book of Exodus, 
Exodus is divided up into three main parts. There's the part with Israel in Egypt. Then there's the part with Israel in the desert. And then there is the part with Israel at Sinai, uh, which is the, uh, the foot of the mountain really close to where they are to cross over into the promised land. And they spend a lot of time in that part of, um, of the uh, wilderness because they were too stubborn to follow God and receive the promise early. And so they spend 40 years wandering in the desert, mainly so a few generations could die off and God could raise up a new generation that would be willing to follow God, accept the promise, accept the covenant, accept the Ten Commandments, accept the, uh, the gift of the promised land and their future. Uh, now, the time of Israel in Egypt, surprising uh, to me, is that it takes 12 chapters uh, to get the people out of Egypt. Uh, there's the time of the slavery in Egypt. There is the time that Moses runs away from Egypt into Median where uh, he is chosen by God at the burning bush. There's the time where God sends Moses back to Egypt to have an ongoing conversation and confrontation with Pharaoh. There's the plagues, the ten plagues that strike Egypt. And then there is the, the first Passover, uh, where God is providing mercy and showing his grace because of the covenant that he has to the people known as Israel. That is chapters 1 through 12. Really not all of 12, but uh, beginning in uh, chapter 12, verse 31 through uh, chapter 18, Israel spends a lot of time in the desert. There's the exodus, there's the crossing of the Red Sea, and then there is a period and a kind of a spiral rotation of their complaining in the desert. Uh, that's kind of like our life, isn't it? We spend a lot of time complaining in the wilderness. I'm raising my hand. I'm guessing you're at home raising your hand that, that we all spend that time uh, in, in the wilderness. Uh, but I don't think we spend that time in the wilderness away apart from God. I think we spend a lot of time trusting in God. We're just trying to figure out what direction God is sending us. And so when we get to uh, chapters 19 through the last chapter, chapter 40 of Exodus, uh, we, we are receiving the law. There's the giving of the law. There's the instructions, the very specific instructions, which take a, a lot of pages uh, on how the tabernacle is to be built. And then after that, there's the breaking of the law, breaking of the law that was handed down. Uh, and then... After that, there is the actual construction of the tabernacle itself. And so um, w when we talk about the law, I always like to look at the Ten Commandments that come out of Exodus, Exodus chapter 20, and then a few chapters later, uh, the, these laws are repeated. A lot of these laws are repeated again in Deuteronomy. But um, these laws lead us into the benefits of fruitful living, and I like to look at those as... Uh, thankfully, Jesus Jesus explained this. He summarizes the commandments when he's uh, approached by someone who says, what is the greatest commandment? And Jesus uh, kind of sums it up in two laws, love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And really what that is, is the love of God uh, takes care of really the first four commandments. Have no other gods before me. Don't take the Lord and uh, his name in vain. Don't make any idols. Um, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. And then there's the, the, the fifth that goes into the tenth that really focus on uh, community relationships, starting, of course, with uh, honor your father and mother for the days may be long or the days may be long. Um, it begins with our household, a covenant relationship with our households to honor our family uh, so that we can learn how to have relationship outside of our household, which is the last handful of commandments that come to us, the relationship that we have uh, with community. Do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not kill, uh, do not covet that which is your neighbor's, those kind of uh, 
those kind of commandments are teaching us how to communicate and how to relate in community. And so Jesus, Jesus being a good uh, Jewish man, knew these commandments and knew how to sum them up. If we remember to love God above everything else, then we are more able to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so that's kind of the blueprint and how the book of Exodus is broken out. But out of that comes these mega themes, these themes that teach us even today the things that we need to know. There's the theme of slavery being uh, held up in bondage. Um, there's the uh, idea, the theme of, of receiving rescue or redemption. Redemption plays a really big part in this scripture, especially for Christians when we have looked through the, uh, the lens of Christ. Redemption means that uh, one is purchasing our freedom. And so when we think early in the Old Testament, Genesis and Exodus, God is already working on telling his story, his purpose for the human race is to redeem us so that we might have renewal of relationship to be put back into the right relationship with God, that he is purchasing our freedom. He did this through Moses, Moses being the, the vessel who went into Egypt and met the uh, Pharaoh time after time to, to make sure that, uh, that the Pharaoh understood that God is uh, more powerful, the sovereign Lord over everything, and God was going to have victory in this. And so there's slavery, there's rescue and redemption. But when we receive uh, rescue and redemption, when our freedom has been purchased, we have a responsibility in the covenant relationship to accept guidance. And so guidance comes into the, the, the fact that we need a leader. We need a guide to guide us into that place of righteousness. Moses was the leader. God gave him authority to lead the people uh, and teach them through the Ten Commandments. Uh, so those themes flow out of this, but also in the whole process of this, there is the building of God's holy people, which is the nation of Israel the whole body of believers. And so we can think about that too as, as God uh, in, his, in his whole purpose of uh, sending Jesus, sending Christ to us, that we also have been built into a nation, a nation of believers, one body in unity. And so when we read through Exodus, we have the ability to, to, to learn these things uh, and to begin to live them out. Uh, I uh, have this, uh, this reading that I want to share with you uh, that, that's kind of like cliff notes uh, for the Bible, but these are really good uh, cliff notes, uh, the summary of Exodus. Uh, I want to read some of this to you because I think it's important for our learning uh, that when we think about Exodus and the redemption that we have received, that, that um, this is really where the theology begins to rise up in the the theology of what God was doing and planning to do through uh, sending Jesus, the Messiah, for us. And so this says the book of Exodus begins more than 400 years after Joseph, his brothers, and the Pharaoh he once served have all died. The new leadership in Egypt, feeling threatened by Jacob's descendants who have increased in great number, embarks on a campaign to subdue the Israelites, forcing them into slavery and eventually decreeing that all Hebrew boys must be killed at birth in the Nile River. The Hebrew women resisted the decree and one woman opts to save her newborn son by setting him afloat on the river in a papyrus basket. Fortunately, Pharaoh's daughter happened to be at the river at that time, and she discovers the abandoned child and decides to raise him after he has been nursed by his mother, and she names him Moses. I've always heard that the name Moses means to be drawn out. This is why he was named Moses, because he was drawn out of the river when all these young boys were being killed um, because the Pharaoh was scared of the, Israel, the Israelite nation growing. 
uh, he was drawn out and saved, and he was taken into the Pharaoh's home to be raised. But Moses is aware of his Hebrew roots, and one day he kills an Egyptian who was beating an Israelite worker. So Moses flees in fear to Midian, a town near Sinai, where he meets a priest named Jethro, and he marries Jethro's daughter. He began his new life as a shepherd, but God met him. Because God was concerned for the suffering of the Israelites, he appears to Moses, as we know, in the form of a burning bush, informing Moses of his plan to return the Israelites to Canaan, to a land that is flowing with milk and honey, to take them out of captivity and to give them a beautiful place of redemption, a place that they might call their own, a land flowing with milk and honey, which comes from Exodus 3, verse 8. And so his plan is to send Moses back to Egypt to accomplish this task. Now Moses, he's timid, he resists, citing a lack of eloquence and a lack of abilities, and he refuses to go. And so God becomes angry but instead of smiting, like we might think that he might do, you know, God is a God that is slow to anger. A God is a God who is compassionate. He's angry, but instead of doing something against Moses, he encourages Moses, presenting him with the staff that performs miracles and instructing Moses to take his brother Aaron. Now, when Moses asked God, who should I tell the people that, that who sent me? God simply says, tell them I am who I am. And that's from Exodus 3, verse 14. So Moses and Aaron, they return to Egypt where Moses organizes the Israelites and confronts the Pharaoh, demanding the release of the Hebrew people. Moses performs a miracle, turning his staff into a snake. But Pharaoh is unimpressed and only increases the workload for the Israelites. God responds by inflicting a series of how many? How many plagues? Ten plagues. He, he, he gives these, inflicts a series of ten plagues on Egypt. And he begins by turning the Nile uh, into blood, the river into blood, which the Pharaoh's magicians could also do that, some kind of trick that they did. They're like, we can turn water into blood also. We're not afraid of your God. Pharaoh's not going to let the people go. And so God begins to cause other plagues to rise up that the, uh, the Pharaoh and his magicians can't really keep up with. Uh, he causes frogs to cover uh, Egypt. He turns all the dust in Egypt to gnats? Wouldn't that be annoying? We go outside in the summer and we get a gnat in our eye. Can you imagine that all the dust in the area has been turned into gnats? My Bible says lice. John's Bible says lice. That is something I did not want to hear. Okay, so, so yeah, so some translations say that these little flying critters were not gnats, but lice. And so those of you with children in school, you certainly know the fear that that would cause, right? So, God turns the Nile River into blood. He causes frogs to cover Egypt. He turns all the dust into gnats or lice. He causes swarms of flies to come into the houses of Pharaoh and his official. God then strikes Egypt's livestock with a disease. He creates festering boils on humans and animals and sends thunder, hail, and fire that destroys the crops. Livestock. It destroys not only the crops, but the livestock and the people. And then God sends a swarm of locusts, and it covers Egypt with darkness that can be felt. Now, this has taken us all the way to chapter 10, where the uh, locusts show up, chapter 10. Before each plague, Moses demands the Israelites' release, and after each plague, God purposefully hardens Pharaoh's heart so that he refuses the request we find this statement made both in chapter 4 and chapter 7. Now, I always wondered, you know, okay, so God hardened the heart of Pharaoh so that 
the Pharaoh would not. You know, many times he goes, okay, I'll let your people go, and then he changed his mind and he didn't let them go. Um, the human side of Pharaoh showing up, but God was hardening his heart. And so I was reading today, why is that so? Why, 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 why would God do that? You know, a lot of times we say, well, God is trying, uh, hardening the heart of Pharaoh so that he can show his, um, his uh, sovereignty, his power over anything else. But also, the reading that I read today said that God didn't have to work too hard to harden Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh had already become hardened scared of the Israelites, the numbers in their population. He wanted to show his power over them and even his people in uh, his palace and his kingship, the Pharaoh, his people had been saying that he was getting worse and worse, almost like he was becoming um, a, a little overboard uh, and evil. And really a lot of the things that he was doing to the Israelites was evil. And so God didn't have to work too hard to harden Pharaoh's heart because his heart was already against God um, and in a bad way. And so the tenth plague that comes about, the final plague, is the killing of all the firstborn males in Egypt. Now, the, the book of Exodus opens with Pharaoh killing all of the young males, the firstborn males, and now this is how God shows his power and his sovereignty by taking this, this evil man and, and, and just taking all the firstborn. Before this plague, though, Moses instructs the Hebrew people to cover their doorpost in blood of a sacrificed lamb as a sign uh, for God to protect their homes uh, from these killings. And so when, when the, uh, the Spirit of God comes and all the Israelite firstborn boys were protected, and you, you, can you imagine, you could probably hear the crying in the streets and the households of the Egyptians, uh, the families who had lost their firstborn. This came to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh relents, and he releases more than 600,000 Israelites who... Uh, we're told by God to take the gold and take the silver uh, to plunder the Egyptians, to, to weaken them a little bit. Now Moses enjoins the Israelites to com commemorate this day of saving the Israelite firstborns. We know that day is, anybody know what that day is? The day of celebration. We as Christians don't celebrate it except we celebrate a day close to Easter on Monday, Thursday. And so this day starts with a P. I know you're going to be typing soon. I think John knows it. You know it too. I'm waiting for it to show up. I'm giving you a second. I think our Internet's a little slow. But it is Passover. Passover. Because the Spirit of God passed over the Israelites' homes to save the firstborn of the Israelites. And so um, the festival of Passover, named for God's protection from the final plague, uh, which is, we learn about in um, Exodus chapter 4. So the Israelites are set free, and they are leaving um, uh, Egypt heading out to uh, the, the desert wilderness area, and they are guided by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire during the night with Moses leading the way, and the Israelites begin to head westward toward the sea. For some reason, I, I don't understand, uh, you know, I guess it's because of the hardening of the heart. Pharaoh had just seen all the Egyptian boys killed families without their sons but it says that pharaoh chased them he couldn't stay home he couldn't just let the israelites go his pride got more got to him more than it should have uh, and so pharaoh chases them the israelites complain that moses has taken them to just die in the wilderness and moses at god's bidding parts the sea for the people to cross Pharaoh's army follows, Pharaoh included, and Moses closes the water back again just by holding up the staff. 
we all we all have seen the I think we might have all seen the uh, the movie Ten Commandments with Charlton Heston. What a beautiful scene of of Moses uh, taking command with God's staff and. Uh, when the last Israelite crosses through the, uh, the parted sea, the uh, Egyptian uh, army is coming across and the water just begins to just pour again over the top of them. And so, uh, and so the uh, uh, Israelites are set free. They've made it across the Red Sea. Um, and um, what, what happened here was a witnessing of a miracle and the people decide for a moment to trust Moses. And they sing a song celebrating God um, as a great but loving warrior. Their optimism, as all human beings again testify. Can you see my question? Yeah, I'm sorry. Can what, you see my question? I cannot see your question. What did you ask? Can you see your question? What did you ask? Is Pharaoh Moses' brother or his nephew? Um, that's a good question. We'll need to look that up. Do you have that in your no, study Bible? It, it was always my understanding that that Pharaoh at that time was Moses' brother. But I will get the, an answer to that uh, as soon as I can. Does anybody out there? Oh, Melissa answered nephew. Nephew, okay. Melissa, I wondered why you said that a while ago because I never saw John's answer. Didn't I didn't see your question. I did not know. Nope, I don't see it in here. The last thing I saw you type was, Hi, Julie. Hi, Julie. Um, so that's a good question. We need to research that. I always thought it was his brother. But also we know that there was intermarrying going on, and so we, we're not really sure. That is something we will look up, and we will get an answer to that. So, Melissa, you might be right. It might be the nephew. So... So they're guided through, through the, the, uh, the Red Sea. Their optimism is brief, and the people soon began to worry about the shortage of food and water. God responds. See, and this is the beautiful thing, you know, that God is always participating. God is always cooperating with his creation. And uh, so here, even in this moment, when the people are grumbling and complaining, God responds by sending them food from heaven, providing a daily supply for a little while of quail, and then the manna that comes down from heaven, a sweet bread-like substance. The people are required only to obey God's commandments to enjoy this food, and which means we read through there that they are given very specific instructions to go out and gather up the food just enough uh, to feed their family for that day. And what this does, it builds in their their hearts an understanding, a trust in God that, that God is going to supply them and God is going to provide for them day after day, that they need not worry about where their food comes from. Jesus talks about that in, in Matthew 7, uh, you know, when he's finishing up the Sermon on the Mount, says, you know, do not worry that God takes care of the birds. Certainly he's going to take care of us. That manna from heaven was taking care of the people. And God made it so if they gathered too much, well, it wouldn't be very good to eat it the next morning uh, because it would uh, start to mold and mildew and become rotten and have a terrible taste to it. So he was raising up a people who would be obedient, and all they had to do was obey God's commandments to enjoy this food. Soon after, the Israelites um, are, are, are warring a people called the uh, Amalekites, um, and God gives the Israelites the power to defeat them, and you have this uh, this scene in Scripture where where anytime Moses raises up his arms, the Israelites are able to rout their opponents. When his arms got tired, he put his arms down. Whew, the uh, the uh, Israelites were getting beat by their enemies, and so. Uh, uh, I think it was Aaron and Joshua who came over and lifted up Moses' arms to keep his arms held up so that the Israelites had the ability uh, to win the battles that they found themselves in. And so um, we're going to switch a little bit and talk about uh, a, a deeper concept in the book of Exodus. Uh, while Genesis explains the origin of the world and humanity and God's connection with humanity, 
Exodus is really, it becomes the theological foundation of the Bible. Exodus explains the origins of the Torah, the law of the Jewish people, and the tradition surrounding the law. Uh, the Torah uh, is not merely a list of laws, but rather um, it, a, a notion of a way of life. The, the, the law itself, if done appropriately, becomes a way of life. For us, we understand this as sanctification, that we grow closer to God and we want to do good works and good deeds, but we know, we understand that, that it's not the works that save us. It is by grace that we have been saved through faith. And we grow in that faith, and that faith brings us beyond just understanding that we are set free and justified, that we are made right with God, but we grow and mature in our faith and become sanctified, sanctifying grace that sets us apart for the holiness of God. And that's kind of where the Torah began to be a way of life. It was imprinted in their hearts and their minds that this is the way that they should live. And, um, and humans struggled with that, the breaking of the Ten Commandments, uh, not, not only with Moses throwing them down, but immediately building the golden calf, building the golden calf because Moses was too long up the mountain, shows that people struggle with the laws and that is why we need a God who is slow to anger, a God who is compassionate, a God who gives us an opportunity to, to live for him because his mercies are new each and every day. Uh, the Torah is, is um, a, a way of life, the way that Moses and his people began to live. And it says, although portions of Exodus are devoted to legal matters, the declaration of the law in Exodus always comes in the form of a story relayed by a discussion between God and Moses and then between Moses and the people. God would tell Moses something on the top of the mountain and then Moses would take it down the mountain to the people and so the laws became a, a flow from God through Moses who God had given authority uh, into the people who began to trust Moses more and more. But as a wayward people, they found them t themselves lost in the wilderness and stopped, stopped believing at times that they were going to get out of the wilderness. And so 40 years, 40 years in the desert. Uh, in Genesis, God uses symbols such as the rainbow and gives people new names like Abraham. He was Abram and then he became Abraham. Um, as a sign of his covenant. Such personalized signs are used when communicating a promise to a single person or a family. In Exodus, however, God attempts to communicate his promise to an entire nation of people. Social laws on how the Israelites should treat their slaves, annual festivals such as Passover, these are signs that communicate uh, to a community of people that they can live together in community and stay healthy and stay connected and stay unified. And so these laws became very important, especially when we get into Leviticus. Tomorrow night we'll get into Leviticus, and Leviticus kind of uh, goes deeper than just the Ten Commandments. It has the ramification of what each one of the Ten Commandments really means. And so God gives Moses additional laws that kind of flow out of the Ten Commandments to teach us how to honor God, the active way to honor and worship God, and then the active, compassionate way to love our neighbors, live in community with one another. And so sometimes you're like, why are all these Levitical laws there? Well, they needed to be there in order to keep the people united, together, in good health. Can you imagine 600,000 people living together in the desert, living in tents, in close community. Um, there would be all kinds of illnesses if they didn't have cleanliness laws. So that kind of makes sense. Hey, you know, maybe that's, maybe they had moments of quarantine like we're quarantined right now. They were having this, uh, this separation in this time of way. Um, one of the things that I read today talks about the Hebrew word for Exodus. I had always thought that it meant to be drawn out and that is one form of the word 
but it also originally means names, just simply names, and Exodus is often called the book of names. The book discuss, discusses the different names of God and the different variety of ways that God manifests himself to the Israelites. We saw that early on in chapter 3 when God tells Moses that his name is I Am. God defines himself as a verb a lot of times rather than a, rather than a noun. Um, most often, however, God reveals himself to the people through uh, theophany through extraordinary natural phenomena that signal God's arrival and presence. For example, uh, that when they left Egypt, they uh, followed Moses, who was following God, who showed himself extraordinarily uh, through uh, the pillar of cloud by day and the fire by night. God also shows his presence, shows his presence through thunder at Mount Sinai. And then he shows his presence, he shows his uh, provision by showing uh, the, the manna that rained down from heaven each and every day. So these, these are ways that theology rises up to help us to understand that, that God is looking for faithful people because he himself is so very faithful, that he is faithful to rescue us. He's faithful to redeem us, to set us free, to give us freedom. And the only thing that he asks of us is that we believe and that we in turn love him. Because by loving him, we find out that it is easier to love one another. And so that really is uh, uh, Exodus in a nutshell. Um, if you have any questions other than uh, who Pharaoh is as far as family relation to, um, to Moses, we'll look that up and we'll see if we can get that posted for you. But I'll wait a few minutes and see if there's any questions. Um, and in the meantime, I'll go ahead and offer a prayer for us so that we can just bow our hearts to God and uh, give him thanks for this learning that we've had from Exodus tonight. Let us pray. Lord, as you've created us, you've created us in your image. As, as you've created us, you've created us with, a, with perfection inside of us. And yet, in our human selves, we find ourselves becoming lost uh, in the wilderness, lost and wayward, uh, lost and, and, and like a prodigal son needing to come back to you. And you, Lord, you never leave us nor forsake us. You always give us opportunities to return to you. You give us day after day new mercies, new chances to wake up and change our lives and to rend our hearts and to come after you. And in this story of uh, Moses throughout Exodus, we learn of your sovereignty. We learn of your provisions, that you are a great provider, that all we have to do is to trust in you and live in obedience to you. So I pray this evening, Lord, that, that we as a people, as your church today, that we can really study in our spirits what it means for each one of us individually to be obedient to you. Because obedience may be different for one than it is another. So we're asking, Lord, tonight that you help us to come up with ways, the means of grace, those pathways and channels that we find that bring us closer to you, those spiritual disciplines, the praying that we do, the reading of scripture and that time and devotion, all of that that brings us closer to you, closer to an understanding of your sovereign ways and that you are God, you're the king of all kings that provides for us each and every day. And all we have to do is say, thank you, Lord, I trust in you. Lord, may we say that freely because you have redeemed us and set us free. May we trust in you and may we continue to give you thanks for all that you've done for us through the saving grace we find through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's in his precious name that we pray this evening to you. Amen. Amen. All right. Thanks, guys, for joining us tonight. I hope that you learned a little bit more about Exodus. Tomorrow we'll start our uh, study in um, Leviticus. 
uh, not sure if, uh, if uh, we'll get through all of Leviticus, but we're going to give it our best shot. Uh, we're going to try to do a summary, but you may want to come with your questions. I encourage you again to uh, go to the Bible Project on YouTube and uh, start watching some of these videos ahead of time. Uh, because that may help us to start getting into a question and answer time. And uh, John, we're going to look up the answer uh, to uh, the relationship between Moses and Pharaoh and find out if we know that. So uh, bless you guys. We'll see you soon. Thanks for tuning in. Looking forward to seeing you tomorrow night. Take care.